audience. I welcome our panelists. Thank you so much for accepting our invite to be here to discuss this so important topic that you have been discussing in the IGF. So I would like to open this session. This is the Town Hall 55, includes IE regulation perspective from four continents. And uh, now without do further belongings, I would like to pass the, the mic to our host and moderator to uh, Christopher Lutz, Professor Christopher Lutz from the Nautic Center for Internet and Society, the BI Norwegian Business School Academy. Uh, thank you so much, and please, the floor is yours, Christoph. Thank you so much, Fernanda, for the kind introduction. Um, so I will be the, the online moderator of this session, um, and I will just say a few words before we start and then give the floor to our four illustrious speakers. So the goal of this session is really to have a kind of comparative perspective on AI regulation to get insights from different continents. So it's termed inclusive AI regulation perspectives from four continents. Um, and we will try to really uh, get insights from, from different countries, from different backgrounds, and then uh, get the conversation going. So the way it's organized, we will have four uh, input presentations, each one about nine minutes. Um, and then after these short in input presentations, we will go, we will open the uh, floor for discussion. So if you have any questions, please write them down and uh, keep them ready. You can also post them in the chat and we will um, forward them to the speakers. And we hope to, to really keep this very open and conversational. Um, so this session is actually an ongoing um, part of an ongoing research project that is in collaboration with ITS Rio and also with the Berkman Klein Center. So the, uh, the session is very much in the spirit of that research project, um, on, which is funded by the Research Council of Norway, um, and is about triple partnership of responsible uh, AI. So bringing different uh, backgrounds, different perspectives together to think more closely about how we can uh, govern AI in a responsible fashion. So um, without further ado, I will in introduce our first speaker. We will go in the order of the program. So we will start with Selina Bottino. Um, Selina has a master's degree in human rights from Harvard University and undergraduate degree in law from the Pontifical Catholic University in Rio. Um, and she's an expert on human rights and technology. She was a researcher at the Human Rights Watch in New York and a supervisor at the Human Rights Clinic in the Fondação Getúlio Vargas in Rio de Janeiro. Um, and she was a consultant for the Harvard Human Rights Clinic as Associate of the Children's and Adolescents' Rights Protection in Rio de Janeiro, Celina is currently developing research in the human rights and technology field. She is affiliated with Harvard's Berkman Klein Center and Project Director at the Institute for Technology and Society of Rio de Janeiro. And she uh, will give us insights on responsible AI and governance from her perspective. So I hand over the floor to you, Celina. Thank you, uh, Christoph, and it's a pleasure to be here uh, with all of you, uh, even though it's in the Zoom. <laughs> but uh, it's important for us to, to have this opportunity to uh, ch exchange experiences, since the idea here is each one bring a bit of perspective from different uh, continents. Uh, and so I'm, as uh, being from Brazil, I'll try and give a bit of uh, a feeling of how this issue is being, uh, it's going in the region more specifically here in Brazil. So I like to, I always like to remember that uh, we first started to discuss about this issue of AI and inclusion. It was five years ago in the first, in the event that ITS organized with the NOC and the other friends here uh, back in Rio where we discussed uh, the framing of the problem would be of, of AI as from an inclusive perspective. And uh, I would say that at the time, parts of the challenges that were um, that were pointed out are still remains, but uh, regarding uh, access to uh, infrastructure and also access to, to knowledge, but, uh, and I'll just illustrate with one project that we're doing uh, how th this is still an issue. But I would say that uh, from the policy perspective, uh, lots of developments, uh, we, we, saw, we saw lots of uh, different developments on this, on, this, on this front. So regarding uh, one of the challenges that we still have to uh, deal with, 
which means uh, access to, to data and also access uh, to knowledge regarding AI. So as we all know, data is the, fir the most uh, first for important uh, element when we're talking about AI. With no data, the AI is kind of useless. Uh, so, um, but still we have a lot of, uh, of gaps when we, uh, when we are talking about, uh, machine readable, uh, data in here in, in Brazil, for example. So ITES is doing this project with the public defense office here in Rio, in which the idea is that, uh, AI would be used to help the, their, the public defenders on their work, which which means like uh, addressing the issues of the all underprivileged people that cannot have access to, uh, could not pay for a lawyer. So they have this, uh, Brazil has this uh, service of free access to justice. So uh, one idea would, the idea of the project would be to map uh, all of the issues regarding uh, medicines that uh, people have to, we have to go to the judiciary to ask for access to have uh, to specific medications. So uh, the point of the project would be to help with AI map and understand which kind of, of medications are most, for example, are mostly uh, demanded and towards uh, against the public uh, office, uh, pu the public sector, or for example, addressing or uh, for the private uh, for the private sector. So this is still not a clear picture of how is the situation on this specific topic. And with the use of, uh, of AI, we could easily try and identify, for example, which are the most uh, demanded and where the most uh, w that where the people are looking for the most of, of kind of, of, of um, medication and with this, in, with this information, it would could help, for example, uh, bring up new public policies and identify uh, other ways to help these people without needing them to go through all the pain to go through access to, uh, to have this medication through a judicial system. So, but we are now facing a uh, issue where in which there is not a uh, good uh, data to do this project so we have the funding we have the the technology but we still is lagging a bit behind on the if the data needed so this is i think uh one of the example in which we still need to work on um on having this uh, minimum infrastructure to develop uh, ai uh, tools with our focusing on uh which has the 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 focus on helping uh solve public uh public issues right public uh problem but just uh quickly jumping to what changed on the policy realm i would say uh that we in the last past five years we saw some uh some specific uh change as we now have Brazil specifically uh, have approved a national idea, a national uh, AI uh, strategy, which still has some issues, was uh, faced some crisis because uh, it was not as spe as specific as expected. It's just kind of uh, uh, another uh, chart of like principles and uh, more. It's uh, more and this uh not not as specific as expected uh and also brazil has more than 20 bill of law bills trying to regulate ai and just yesterday actually uh it was presented uh, a specific bill on that was uh as a result of the work of this commission and that's something that i would like to stress how was how the process went so uh, some law, some specific representatives presented their AI bill, and when uh, they identified that this was a, sp a very technical issue, that they should resort to specialists to help bring up a, a, a bill. So the Senate created this commission of experts 
to try and come up with a, another alternative of, of regulation. And this commission was set up. They provide, they organize several uh, public uh, public hearings and also put some each, some of the topics in, under public consultation. And as a result of this uh, participatory um, uh, uh, endeavor, they presented yesterday their bill. Actually, we still don't have the text. It's not public yet, but they publicly explained the, uh, how, what are the topics. And one of the drivers for us we see is of, for regulating is uh, the topic of responsibility, which there's still a lot of discussion if it should, how, how, how it should be, uh, how, how broad it should, uh, it should be. Um, and uh, just to, I think, conclude, the idea of having this as a result of this uh, specialist commission I think it's it was a nice uh, it was a nice move, but still uh, there were criticisms regarding the, uh, the the composition of the members of the commission. Was it diverse enough? Was it um, uh, inclusive enough? So uh, we still see that uh, maybe uh, it could have been uh, some tweaks to make it uh, as inclusive as I've expected. But again, we still have another important issue, uh, which was identified five years ago, which is the knowledge gap. We still have, for example, we had a, a course yesterday about AI and, and human rights, and uh, we still see that there's lots of not mis not information. People are not inf they don't know. They, it's still a, a gap that we need to to overcome of trying to bring these topics more. Uh, to the people as a whole to make them participate uh, more in all of this uh, on all this process. So I think that's my my final my first uh, remarks, and uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Selena. Perfectly on time. Um, great, this was fascinating and great insights from Brazil, South America. So I, I'll go to our next speaker, which is Samson Isaias. Um, Dr. Samson Isaias is an associate professor at BI Norwegian Business School in the Department of Law and Governance, and his research focuses on the interplay between law, technology, and markets as regulatory tools, with a particular emphasis on the intersection between data privacy and competition law. Um, so, Samson, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Christoph, uh, for the introduction. Um... I'm set to speak about uh, European European perspective, but uh, I'm actually f originally from Ethiopia, where the conference is being held, and uh, it's uh, actually unfortunate that I couldn't be there in person. But hopefully, that people people are having great time in the conference and uh, outside. Uh, but also, I'd like to mention that I'm also from the northern part of Ethiopia, the Tigray region, where there is quite there has been a conflict for the last two years, and it's it's been cut. Uh, from uh, yeah, it has been under communication blackout for the last two, two two years, and where there has been also a great deal of human suffering. Um, and since we are talking about inclusion, uh, it's really my hope that uh, the region gets reconnected, and uh, and that uh, they are they become part of the community, gets uh, to be part of the conversations that is happening in the in the region in Ethiopia, but also uh, across the globe. So having said that, I just want to highlight also talk about what are the main drivers of AI governance and discourse within the European Union. And um, I'll start by just uh, outlining four main broader issues that are basically driving the discussion and the legal uh, the legal initiatives. And then I will try to explain a little bit in relation to some of the aspects that relate to inclusion and diversity. So I would think I would. I would say that there are four main drivers, at least from the way I see it. Uh, the, the first driver for AI discourse and um, uh, the initiatives we see is, of course, the protection of fundamental rights, uh, the protection of human rights, uh, which is which takes quite a significant role in the discussions we have in Europe. So the protection of, of course, data protection, privacy, uh, protection of freedom of expression, and the protection against discrimination. And the protection of vulnerable groups, such as people working for 
for you know this platform driven uh, businesses so that is one one category of driver and of course the second category which is which is also related to some uh, somehow related to fundamental aspect is also concerns about election integrity disinformation so here there is also quite a lot of initiatives that are perhaps for example the way big platforms such as facebook google use ai systems to moderate content so and the risks that come with these kinds of automated mo moderation of content so for those of you who are familiar with the eu framework then there, there is there was uh, there is a new law basically now which is like or an updated version of an existing law, the Digital Service Service Act that provides or that imposes some kinds of obligations on these big platforms to manage systematic risks to elections, disinformation when they use AI for moderating content. And the, the third strand or driver is liability and safety of AI. So here, uh, of course, there is, a, there is a question of liability. What happens if AI systems such as self-driving cars cause harm? So what, what, how should we address uh, those concerns? And there is also initiative here, the European Commission has also proposed a law for regulating liability of these kinds of systems. And the fourth border driver of the discourse is uh, related to this divide in data control. So Selena alluded to this uh, importance of data for AI, for development of AI. So I think there is also similar concern in Europe where uh, there is this divide between uh, few companies that are able to create significant value from the data on the one hand, and then of course users which are the main generators of the data and should also benefit from that data, and together with also small businesses and public agencies interest in getting access to that data again here there are also legislative initiatives within the european union uh, such as the uh, data act data governance act that kind of try to facilitate the sharing of data uh, 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 and also facilitate that small businesses could be able to get access to data and you know develop 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 services so I think these are uh, the way I see it, these are the main major major drivers. And of course, the, the, the panel is specific in relation to inclusion. So I would just say a few words about uh, the focus on fundamental rights and specifically a little bit about the draft AI Act and how it tries to address some of these uh, concerns in, in relation to inclusion and um, diversity. Uh, so the AI Act, uh, the main aim of the AI Act is uh, states that it is it has AI should should serve the human or it should be human centric. So it should serve uh, humans, and there are you see many many cases. So the focus seems to be in terms of identifying specific use cases that seem to endanger or to create high risks or uh, unacceptable risks to human rights, safety of individuals. So you have certain systems that are being prohibited. You have certain systems that are uh, that require that you have to do lots of things, risk management, data governance framework. And if you see some of these use cases, they seem to be driven by some of the, uh, some of the things that have happened in the last few years, some kinds of uh, AI users that led to uh, discrimination or uh, other other violations of uh, human rights. So we have had, I think, in Europe, we have had the use of AI for grading during the pandemic, where AI has been used to give grades to the students because they couldn't go to school. And that kind of raised lots of concerns uh, in relation to discrimination because uh, excellent students living in, in poor neighborhoods would be given lower grades because the schools that they went in performed poorly historically, whereas a, a mediocre student go, uh, going to schools in affluent areas might get a good grade because the schools they went in might, might have performed well historically. So that kind of concern seemed to be, seem, seem to be one of the, the things that are taken into account in the AI Act. So for example, now the AI Act says that if you are using AI systems for making decisions about education, for grading, or for making admission decisions, 
detailed uh, requirements. We have also similar concerns in terms of the use of AI for making social benefit decisions. So this is also regulated, highly regulated now in the AI in the AI Act. And then we have also a different set of regulation focusing on platform workers, people working for Uber, you know, these uh, food delivery companies, because there are lots of concerns in terms of surveillance of those workers, but also how they use algorithms, AI systems to manage to manage those workers. So there are quite detailed obligations in terms of transparency, explain explainability. So I think those are some of some of the drivers. And I think I will I will I will also stop here and then perhaps we'll have a, a chance to discuss more during the QA. Great. Thank you so much, Samson, for the insightful uh, presentation and the insights from Europe. Uh, our third speaker will uh, give the perspective on uh, Africa and more specifically South Africa. And we have with us Sean Pather. So um Sean is a professor and chair of the Department of Information Systems in the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences at the University of the Western Cape in South Africa. Uh, he is an ICT for development expert and National Research Foundation rated researcher who focuses on the information society and related issues, especially digital divide, digital inequality and uh, uplifting uh, rural communities. So I'll give the floor to you, Sean. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Christoph, and a very good afternoon to your colleagues. Uh, apologies from me as well for not being able to be there in person. Uh, I would have really liked to have been there. Uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, I had to go on a bit of uh, unexpected leave. But thanks. Uh, just to share some perspectives from my side, from 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 an African, uh, without particularly Christoph focusing on on South Africa. Uh, I think first and foremost, it's important to remind ourselves AI being a, a phenomena of, of digitization, to remind ourselves of the state of digital inequality, uh, drawing on ITU's most recent uh, facts and figures. Um, well, we, we kind of have a sense of, 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 a, of, of a, you know, continued penetration of, of people into the network but where does Africa stand in all of this? And uh, to remind ourselves that um, in terms, you know, compared to the rest of, of the world, Africa is still sitting at a 40%. And even inside of this 40%, we must remind ourselves of how ITU actually collects this data, which is through mobile operator data, uh, or, or, or operators' data through the regulators. Even inside even this 40%, there's a lot of, discrimination. So that in itself is not quite accurate. Key factor around around this, even though that the network infrastructure starts to, to, to spread is that of affordability. And as you can can note here is that uh, at, at, at a from a basket perspective, 5% and 15.6% as a percentage of uh, gross national income is indicating is indicative um, uh, this, by the way, is of uh, mobile broadband, and this is fixed broadband, of the expense um, in Africa to the average African person making making uh, access to the network uh, prohibitive. From a generational gap as well, you see the inequality here. This is reflecting youth, so the percentage of among youth of penetration, 55% and 36% of, of, of others. And you can see the vast difference as you look across this infographic uh, compared to the rest of, of, of the uh, continents. Um, skills being the other issue, this is for a slightly older bit of data from 2021. But again, as you can see here, that basic skills in the African continent, by virtue of these shadings here, you could see that very, very low levels of skills. So the problem, and, and all of this ITU data really talks about, uh, you know, penetration and access, et cetera. But the equality problem in Africa is, 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 is multifaceted. So whilst all of this is around infrastructure um, and, and the quality, the skills, affordability, and universal access, so, so multiple perspectives to deal with. 
So with all of that already in place in a state of inequality, let's for a moment, and I'm not going to speak in, in my nine minutes about, about the cases of inequality because I take it for granted. We all know very well these are documented and we couldn't, there's a growing body of literature on the inequalities created by um, fourth industrial revolution technologies. Um, fortunately, uh, I came across uh, an alt advisory uh, policy brief which was concluded in uh, just around the middle of this year, published in September 2022. And their uh, Alt Advisory did an assessment of AI governance in Africa across all countries using these six indicators, uh, whether there's dedicated AI legislation, data protect protection legislation, national strategy, uh, draft policy or white paper in relation to AI, uh, expert commissions, and whether AI features as a priority in the country's national development plan. The, the findings from, from, from that don't look very good. No country has dedicated AI legislation. Mauritius has partial legislation. Mm -hmm. 30 countries have data protection, and this is where there seems to be more effort happening at the moment, uh, which addresses automated decision-making. Four countries have a national strategy. One country has a draft policy or a white paper. 13 countries have expert commissions and six countries include AI as a priority. So it's not as if there is no effort. There is a, 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 a some effort as when I look back to last year, uh, when we dis discussed this, I think it didn't seem, so it seems that slowly some momentum is picking up, not enough, but a lot of the momentum and effort the, thus far is around data protection in relation to automated decision-making. And uh, as you can see here is that about 55% of the countries had something in place in, in, in that regard. Um, so, so with all of that, um, so if we have to move beyond, I mean, we're in a state of digital inequality. Um, we are struggling or we're having a very slow start in the continent in terms of beginning to create some kind of governance, uh, AI governance framework and, and policy. So at the African Union in 2020, they, it's not as if this is absent from the agenda. In, in, in the 2020, uh, um, uh, in a 2020 gathering that they speak of the African digital transformation strategy and speak of leapfrogging. So there's a sense, sense of leapfrogging the opportunity that somehow from a digital perspective, the continent's been behind and that with the presence of AI, that, so this is where the continental policymakers talk, or, you know, are seeing the future. But the problem and the danger of thinking of leapfrogging without understanding the matter is that is that the average poor person, number one, is digitally excluded. A proportion might have access and use to basic ICTs, right, uh, for those who are fortunate. But technology developments, including AI, machine learning, are not focused on how they might be used to support the social and economic development of poor and marginalized people. And the, and the fourth issue is that AI is driven by data. But the problem is if the populations are not involved in the creation of the data, or if their data, we're not drawing data from the people on where the applications are going to be used, they will remain outcasts because we will have ineffective or unequal data sets which are used to train AI applications. So that's fundamentally at the source of the problem. You have inactive people on the Afri African continent in the digital society, which means that our data sets are not representative. And for me, that's where the heart of the problem is. So we have to shift focus. Um, currently, um, progress has been made in respect of privacy and protection, as I pointed out just now. The discussions and debates for me suggest that, um, that that we, while we are looking at how AI is used to develop economies, how do you make monies and profits, there's no effort in terms of how it might, on, on, on issues of inclusion and diversity. So that is central for me. Um, the, the leapfrog term used by the a, a, AU without thinking about the impacts on deepening poverty and entrenching digital inequality. So whilst leapfrog, leapfrogging is a wonderful notion, but if we don't think about the ramifications of it, then we will and might have an African policy position if we only simply take an economic growth perspective. So we have to increase participation and policy and governance must, must seek to engender 
participation in data infrastructure in a more integrated effort, assessing all of, including all, addressing all of the issues of inequality to ensure that greater participation means that we have people uh, coming uh, into, into, into the data infrastructure. Um, I'm going to skip this other than to say, because I'm all, I see I'm, I'll just have a minute left, uh, Christoph, is that, is that the digital infrastructure projects, right, uh, they are problematic in the way our digital infrastructure projects are created. That in itself is creating uh, inequality, and I draw these points out of uh, recent research done by ICT Africa, Hadzik and Kibben. The citation is there. So in summary, I think we, we need a, 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 a more structured and coordinated response. Um, we, have, we need a common artificial international framework. We need to keep in mind that that's my time up, that ethics is not universal. So when we think about AI and ethics and applications, we've got to think about it in a regional basis. So I am arguing and supporting that there's, we need to do more for, for, for continental-based and regional-based inside of the the continent the governance and policy development. Um, we got to increase transparency and, and, and with my academic hat on, I think we can do more in terms of developing design-based confirmation to an internationally agreed set of principles ar around equality. We need metrics to ris assess risk at software problem scoping stage. We need more research and practical tools to be developed to support software engineering, especially at the testing stage. And we have to look at independent regulation for software, checking of software at all stages of the SDLC to then give permission to software to run without creating uh, inequalities. Thank you. I will stop there. Thank you very much, Sean, for the very interesting presentation and the insights from Africa. And uh, I will move to our last speaker, um, who is San Sandra Cortesi. Dr. Sandra Cortesi is a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University, a senior research and te teaching associate at the University of Zurich and an adjunct researcher in communication at the Department of Communication and Culture at BI Norwegian Business School in Norway. Um, she collaborates closely with talented young people and engages with researchers in the field of youth and media uh, to share their interest in exploring innovative ways to understand, evaluate, and shape current and future social challenges emerging in the digital world, including those relating to AI, emerging technologies, uh, virtual reality, and especially in terms of how to engage youth in our uh, digital society. So Sandra, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Christoph. Uh, delighted to be part of this panel, although I I must say what I'm going to share is merely a reflection of what at Berkman Klein uh, is happening kind of uh, in a very collaborative uh, fashion. Many colleagues working on these issues, including Urs Gasser, who is also here with us today. So I'm, uh, I'm mostly the spokesperson in some ways, but truly excited to be here. Um, so when it comes to Internet governance, uh, kind of from this U.S. perspective, um, the big, big picture suggests that there are many conversations happening among many actors within the private and public sector. We're all involved in developing many different norms uh, of governance. So kind of from an inclusion perspective, this is somewhat good news. It means that different stakeholders are involved in governance issues and how to resolve them. Uh, so again, that is uh, certainly good news. Um, if you take the US as an example, for instance, we take we see inclusion of different stakeholders at the four following different levels of governance making. Um, first, we see um, examples at the city level, for instance, take the example of uh, f uh, the ban of facial recognition uh, in Cambridge, for instance, where we see uh, uh, citizens, kind of local actors act, uh, engaging with uh, local city councils, debating these issues and addressing these issues. Uh, we see, for instance, uh, standard setting organizations like the National Institute of Standards and Technology uh, and new frameworks for risk assessment or debiasing, but also associations like the American Medical Association with guidance for use of AI in health 
by doctors and hospitals as a second example. Uh, thir third example, we see uh, these conversations happening at the state uh, level with state legislators, um, activity and legislation, for instance, when it comes to regulation of self-driving cars, uh, as well as uh, consumer protection issues. Again, here, different stakeholders are involved uh, in lawmaking. Fourth example is at this national uh, level where national legislators uh, are also active. Uh, we see as an example, the uh, Algorithmic Accountability Act that is being under discussion resembles a little bit uh, the EU Act uh, draft law. Uh, although it's very uncertain whether it ever becomes law, uh, given uh, the situation or gridlock in Congress. Uh, maybe as, a, as an addition to that currently, unless there is kind of a national law, which is unlikely to happen anytime soon in the US, uh, the US approaches uh, the U.S. approach to AI governance in itself is different uh, from Europe uh, with the EU Act, for instance. Uh, the U.S. so far has not taken action to regulate AI horizontally, uh, meaning across all sectors and different types of AI. Rather, uh, it thinks of at least at the federal level, uh, um, it leaves much more um, room um, of kind of this regulatory job uh, to specialized uh, sector specific agencies like, for instance, uh, the Food and Drug Administration, so the FDA, uh, in, in the case of medical AI, as an example. So different approaches uh, here uh, discussed or different ways to go about it. Um, so we see, in essence, diversity of forums and spaces with different stakeholders. Uh, but of course, when it comes particularly to inclusion, uh, important participation gaps uh, remain. One of my uh, key topics or issues I very much care about uh, are young people. So take young people as one key stakeholder. Uh, over the last few years, we have seen many countries uh, releasing a range of AI policies uh, uh, or policy initiatives focusing largely on how to leverage AI systems, mostly for economic growth uh, and national competitiveness. Um, but it turns out that many of these national AI plans uh, don't mention children or young people. Um, that it, there is a great mapping by UNICEF who has documented this extensively. Uh, very much recommend you to take a look at it. Um, so also when we look at AI ethics principles, they often don't mention uh, children or young people specifically. Uh, there we did uh, some really cool work with UNICEF, IEEE and the WEF um, that I'm happy to share more in the conversation part. Um, so there is a gap uh, in terms of AI impact on children and young people, but also some initial work, I would say, and the initial activities uh, relevant in terms of AI uh, governance. So I take your youth as an example, of course, similar participation gaps remain in terms of other communities, other underserved communities. Uh, particularly uh, including people of color, uh, very crucial topic uh, currently in the US as well. Uh, so here much more work needs to be done uh, to make process of AI governance, uh, to make AI governance an equitable uh, one, uh, but I'm still, I remain hopeful that, uh, that also within spaces like the one today, uh, we can advance this conversation and then, as I said, uh, much more hopefully to come. So thank you so much for having me here. Thank you so much, Sandra, for the insightful presentation. Um, so for the next part, we will move into the discussion. Um, I would suggest um, if you have any questions to please uh, ask them or raise your hand we can pass the questions to the uh, to the presenters and if let's see from the on site are there any questions in addis there is any questions for the audience here anyone 
Not at this point, Christoph. Yes, one. Hi, uh, so my name is Chang and I'm a social entrepreneur from Vietnam and I have a question for a speaker from South Africa. I'm sorry that I came late, I couldn't remember his name and also to other speakers. So I agree with you that uh, different regions do not see eye to eye when it comes to AI ethics. But can you give us an example of how AI ethics from African perspectives might be different from other continents? Thanks. Thank you so much for your question. I will give the floor for Sean Patrick to answer the question and also for the other panelists. Uh, yeah, thank you, Janina. Thank you for thank you for that question. Uh, regretfully, I don't have a uh, I can't I don't have a specific answer to that. There is a body of literature around culture and around ethical practice that one can find or that read that does attest to it. But I can't give you a practical example because it's not an area that I've read read that I am well read in, but all of the, I think the point I was making in the presentation is there's, there's documented research that, that ethics or the, the notion of ethics or the interpretation of what might be ethical in this region might be different in another region. So I, I can't, I don't have a specific one other than to say that I am fully aware that it has been documented. Uh, and I think the point I'm making, just just to get back to it, is is that if we if we are to have some kind of a a, a, a set of universally acceptable guidelines, that there should be some some room within that for regional differentiation. Thank you. Christoph? Thank you. Does anyone else want to add from the other panelists? I, I don't have much specifics to share, but maybe just a point to, to make. There is a colleague at Berkman Klein, Sabello Malambi, who has written a really great piece uh, called From Rationality to Rel Relationality, Ubuntu as an Ethical and Human Rights Framework for Artificial Intelligence Governance. Uh, so adding a particularly African point of view to the conversation, I very much recommend it as a reading um, as a reading piece. So we have another question from the on-site participants. Yes. Thank you. Um, my name is Hadi al Minyawi. I uh, work uh, for the Egyptian Telecom Regulator, uh, but I attend the um, IGF and speak on my own behalf. Um, so from a technical point of view, we definitely have standards. Uh, uh, um, uh, and it is important that um, uh, we have frameworks um, that work together and are uh, interoperable. Um, and um, though we can never have all the same rules, um, uh, uh, because we um, uh, we draw uh, the red lines uh, at different levels, uh, but still uh, uh, we do have standards, uh, um, and uh, we need also to align the terminology that we all use. Uh, um, uh, also, it is important for us also to have uh, metrics and, 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 and measurement tools uh, in order to know uh, where we are. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Christoph, who do you think would like thank to answer this question? Um, thank you for the question. This is a really good point. And I actually touches nicely on, on the, um, one of the questions we raised for, for this panel. Namely, what do you think other regions can learn from the initiatives and responses from your region? So how can we um, engage and make sure that mutual learning takes place when it comes to AI governance and regulation? And since we haven't heard from Samsung and Selena, I would suggest that they maybe go next. So whoever is ready. Yeah, I can, I can start. So, um... I think, yeah, I mean, there are many, at least taking the European initiatives, some of the, there might be some good things to, to take on board. Uh, and of course, this is also recognizing that 
not everything the European Union is doing is going to be replicated on, and, and it's going to be useful for, for other regions. And of course, in relation to the comment that was earlier, also question uh, that was raised in relation to the question of ethics, is it the same thing everywhere, depending on the culture? Uh, but at least I also agree with the uh, the comment that was um, uh, yeah, the comment from our Egyptian colleague that, of course, it's possible to create some kind of framework that, uh, that everyone can agree on. I think at least we have agreed in terms of human rights, basic human rights. I think there is some kind of global consensus on the protection of human rights. And uh, one admirable thing about the European approach is that a lot of the focus uh, going on in this in regulating AI is driven by the protection of human rights. Um, so that's something to take into account. How how do the use of AI basically affect our human rights, our uh, basic fundamental rights? So focusing on that aspect would be relevant, but recognizing that, for example, other regions would also have other interests. For example, in Africa, I think the issues of connection, economic development, access to basic services would be would be essential. So that's basically uh, the role uh, for uh, the local uh, governments to to um, to take uh, to take into account. Yeah, I would just add as. Uh... As we saw, there is not not a clear uh, one definition or one take on all these on all of these topics, and that's why I think it's very important for the conversation of AI governance be as inclusive as possible. And when I say that, I mean from a geographical perspective, as normally these uh, these conversations are being led by North, global North countries in which. Uh, would affect and deprecations would re affect everywhere, all all countries. So, uh, and normally more uh, uh, specifically, global South countries should be uh, heard and should be called to be a part of all of this discussion, so that all of these nuances are bring are brought to the attention once uh, discussing these protocols or all of these uh, topics that we are we are talking. Great, thank you very much. We actually have a question in the chat here. Um, I'm going to read it out and I'm going to leave. Um, so, hello everyone, I am Amir Mokaberi from Iranian Academic Community. My question to the dear panelists is, what, will, what would be the practical approach for AI regulation and AI-based spaces like Metaverse to ensure public safety, security, health, data sovereignty, and accountability of global AI actors? With regard to this fact, that different societies have different ethical and legal frameworks and what should be done for AI related cyber crimes, which is borderless. Thank you for the for the really interesting question. Um, so really about more specific uh, domains such as the metaverse. Does anyone have any any thoughts on, on this question? No, I, uh, to me, it just goes back to what Selena said. I mean, there, there, there is no one silver bullet solution, but we really need to make sure that these conversations happen at the global level and within kind of this global level, what I shared earlier, that we make sure different actors are involved, not only at the at kind of legal actors, but that we include civil society, society and others in these conversations as we may not agree when it comes to these borderless issues um, on, on the solution, but through dialogue, at least through making sure that everyone can participate, we get closer to a solution we might be able to live with. But that's speaking as a psychologist, so maybe <laughs> a legal scholar can add to it. I can add a few points. I think I think he, I don't know, yeah, the, our, our, um, yeah, the question raises quite a few issues and it's, as, as mentioned, it, it would be very different strands of things that we have to talk about. And, um, uh, of course there is the metaphors or any kind of these platforms raise many issues. So the fundamental rights aspect is one thing. So, uh, you, you can, you have to focus on that aspect. But also there are concerns about safety. Uh, so in in Europe again, as I mentioned, 
the AI Act deals a little bit about safety, security also of AI systems, although that focus is very, very specific into some use cases. So the metaverse is not that covered uh, in, that, in that sense. But also you have also content moderation, disinformation concerns that might arise with within these kind of systems. Uh, that is also another aspect that we uh, we have to, to talk about, but also we have at some point when this thing becomes um, concrete uh, to regulate. So, uh, for example, in the EU, uh, at least there is, there is a discussion that this metaverse would be something in the agenda for the next year, uh, discussions uh, in next year, although I don't really see anything, basically any concrete proposal or initiative coming, coming. Uh, coming out. Yeah, um, and maybe an interesting uh, discussion to add. I um, So I think whilst there is, I mean, already a lot of this, I mean, the metaverse is implying some kind of a different level of globalization and the like, and, and, and the like. but from, from, I mean, the question is what, what will be a practical approach? And I, and I do think the practical approach is about Firstly, a global and then regional at regional levels cooperation and agreement on principles and the like, etc. Um, the, the fact that you say that there are different ethical and legal frameworks, that is true, but I do think it is possible to produce a set of globally accepted principles with, within which then there could be some, some delineation and, 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 and focusing and tweaking as aligned to what we've already acknowledged as as differences in regions and cultures around what. But I think, I, I certainly think from an ethical basis, there is a universal set of principles. And in relation to cyber crimes, I mean, globally, well, most countries, not all, have found ways to cooperate around cyber crimes. Uh, and I, but I think this in particular is something that needs far more work to happen because we are grappling, or it is a major, major issue to figure out how to deal and address and prosecute on crimes that are committed from elsewhere. So that is an, uh, a matter that needs to be certainly elevated in the um, uh, international policy planning and, and debates. If may, if I may add just uh, another reference here, uh, quoting colleagues from the uh, Berkman Klein, I will share here on the on the chat the AI principled uh, principled AI uh, report that Berkman put together showing. Uh, analyzing all of the documents regarding uh, principles and AI and trying to show which of uh, where onto what uh, Sean was saying, uh, the conversions at least on at least five, if I'm not mistaken, that would be present in almost all documents, which includes not only government, uh, government uh, documents, but also uh, declarations come uh, from civil society and from uh, industry also sectors so that's another reference that would be helpful great thank you very much um so we have about five to six minutes time and we want to do a very short um last round uh, from each speaker but before that if, if we have any last questions um either online or on site please raise it now yes we do Christoph. Do you have one? Do you have another question? Okay, we have one more question, Christophe. Okay. Thank you, please. Thank you. <laughs> uh, actually, it's more kind of a reflection, but I'd like to hear for you your, your thoughts as well uh, on the possibilities in the near and medium term future uh, in terms of AI governance. Uh, I think uh, there's a l lots of scholars uh, addressing the concept and the idea of digital imperialism, such as Michael Quaid, or digital colonialism, data colonialism, such as Nick Caldry and Mejias. And it's, it's related to the fact that most of the users of the, the platforms that processes data are, are based in, in the so-called global south. Uh, and we have a huge concentration in the market, mainly located in Silicon Valley in the United States. Uh, so, and if, not, and not, if I'm not wrong, I think that even OpenAI, it belongs to Elon Musk, isn't it? So, 
Uh, in Brazil, we have a specific case as well that the Brazilian government started to uh, somehow send uh, the Brazilian health care uh, historical data to be processed in the US by IBM Watson's uh, AI machine, for instance. Uh, and within the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, we have also uh, found that the, the, the same process is taking place uh, within the public education. So my question uh, to anyone who feels comfortable uh, to answer it is, is there space, is there any room for a global uh, memorandum or coalition that uh, we can we make sure that at least for education and health purposes, uh, AI infrastructure should be open and have not for all commercial proposal? Thank you, purpose. Thank you. Back to you, Christophe. Yeah, thank you for the question. I think we can maybe use this as a, as a very quick last round uh, before we close the session. But if all of all of the four presenters could have a very short maybe uh, response to the question, and then we can uh, wrap up the session afterwards. Let's let's maybe go with the order of I the. I couldn't quite hear the questions. So sorry, I can't respond. Oh. Apologies. I was having a sound issue. I can I can start just briefly. Uh, so I think uh, yeah I think it's an important uh, an important uh, question. Uh, is there a space for you know for inclusion for including the global south or everyone into the discussion of both building the AI but also in the in the in the policy making and I, well I mean I I don't know what's happening in many places but I think I think there is quite a lot of room for improvement so. Uh, uh, I think both the development as well as, of course, the policy discourse seems to be driven also from one side, from mostly uh, US, uh, maybe EU or US perspective. So I think uh, I want, uh, perhaps one would uh, like to see more uh, starting bottom up, engaging the local community. And I think in Brazil, at least, we have seen some, some engagements where the local communities get engaged in building their own systems, their own uh, software, for example, for mapping mapping for specific areas. So that kind of look, engaging local local engagement and also financing the, the local uh, entrepreneurs developing such technologies would be would be important. But also uh, a discussion, a discussion that brings perspectives from different uh, regions and uh, People with different backgrounds would be would be required, and I think this platform that we have created now, I think this opportunity would be one thing that we need we need to continue and um, get better at. I think. Great. Just... Yes, please please go ahead. Quickly uh, jump into uh, addressing that uh, comment. Uh, I guess if if there's there's still room, and I think maybe the question is how to uh, how to. Um, be uh, how, how to get this make this room and uh, and uh, move this agenda forward and I would just ask, for example cite what UNESCO is doing as it's trying to be a focus for uh, developing a, 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 a framework for regulating platforms and focusing specifically on the use of data so maybe uh, there is uh, some of these international organizations are already trying to to uh, get a standard mark of a position, and uh, maybe just uh, as you mentioned, education and health uh, coming from the uh, the example from United States. At least if you try to uh, separate from uh, in not trying to do an overall. Uh, 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 policy and uh, trying to go through uh, specific areas, maybe that it would be a, a, a easier way to move forward such uh, of a, a complex uh, discussions. And of course, being also always uh, inclusive and getting everyone that should be there, or at least most of the people uh, should be in a conversation uh, present. Thank you. So we are almost out of, or basically out of time, but um, maybe we can have a, a very short last statement from Sandra and Sean. 
if you have just, a, just a tweet links of course the majority world needs to be included in these processes and conversations uh, it is a complex undertaking as someone who has directed the ai expert mission for colombia and the for, uh, with uh, under the former president uh, I know that it is not easy, but uh, I see a lot of good work happening. A colleague of ours, Armando Guillo, working at CAF, uh, is advancing much debate uh, within Latin America, I think. So in addition to, of course, colleagues at ITS. Um, so there is nowhere, no way where, where this can be done without the majority world. Uh, and maybe as a as a prong again to my favorite community, young people. Young people are one in three uh, of internet users, um, and so they never get a seat at the table. They are rarely being heard, so they have a voice in this and an opinion as well. And they we should do better to include them in these processes as well. So thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Sean. Uh, yeah, okay. I mean, in summary, I mean, my highlights from a governance perspective is one is that for, from the African perspective, beyond economic dimensions, we need to think about governance in a way that doesn't perpetuate the current digital inequalities. Uh, we need governance that guides infrastructure development, especially in respect of data, data related infrastructure. There is a, 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 a data policy framework, but uh, the jury is still out and AU data policy framework. And, and lastly, I think we need to do much more to be able to inform the policy makers and those in charge of governance to be appropriately skilled to understand the issues around AI and, 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 and related matters that are perpetuating. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, with that, I would like to conclude. I want to thank all of the panelists and presenters for the wonderful inputs. It was super interesting. And I especially want to thank also Janaina Costa as the on-site host and moderator and Christian Perone, who was also very strongly involved in preparing this panel. So great thanks to you both. And uh, just very shortly, if, if the presenters could stay just for a minute or so for a group photo, that would be great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so thank much you, for close the session. For... Thank you. Uh, so, Shonaina, how should we do the, the group photo? She may not be there, apparently. Uh, okay. I am talking to them. Just a second. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, everybody ready? Smile. Okay, then. Thank you so much, everybody. It was okay. a really a pleasure. Really stimulating. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Have, Have a good day, day everyone. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Ciao, ciao. Bye-bye. Cheers, folks.